Welcome to this educational activity aimed at addressing practice gaps in the treatment of chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy. CIDP is frequently misdiagnosed, as data suggests that misdiagnosis rates may be as high as 90%. Inaccurate diagnosis contributes to ineffective treatment selection and consequently treatment burden and poorer outcomes. New CIDP diagnosis and treatment guidelines were released in 2021 and are not well known to the treatment community. Hello, my name is Dr. David Kornbluth and I'm professor of neurology at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Welcome to this educational activity entitled Optimizing Outcomes in Chronic Inflammatory Demyelinating Polyneuropathy, Honing Diagnostic Accuracy and Personalizing Treatment Plans. CIDP is a rare acquired autoimmune disorder of the peripheral nervous system. While the etiology is unknown, there are known abnormalities in both cellular and humoral immunity. Activated T cells and macrophages act as antigen presenting cells and bind to targeted structures, usually on myelin, leading to inflammation and demyelination of the largest peripheral nerve fibers. There are many presentations, but classic CIDP is a symmetric sensory motor disorder with weakness and sensory loss affecting both the proximal and distal parts of the upper and lower limbs that involves at least two limbs and progresses over at least eight weeks. The clinical presentation can be monophasic, relapsing, or progressive. The prevalence of CIDP varies considerably around the world and is reported from 0.8 to 8.9 per 100,000. While there are occasional cases reported in infancy, the peak incidence is between 40 and 60 years of age. Males are affected probably twice as often as females. CIDP is quite challenging to diagnose. The reason is because there is no gold standard test to identify a person with CIDP. Rather, the diagnosis is based on a combination of history, signs, and supporting laboratory features, particularly electrodiagnostic studies. There are multiple disorders that can mimic CIDP, which create challenges to the diagnosis. In a moment, we'll review the most recent guidelines on CIDP diagnosis and treatment, but first, we'll get a first-hand account from a patient with CIDP on her early experiences and diagnosis. I was diagnosed at six years old. I found out in November of 2009 when um, my parents started noticing that I was losing function in my lower extremities. And um, I was a pretty fast kid um, when I was younger, and I played a lot of sports, soccer in particular. And one day my dad noticed that I was kind of running funny and that I was slower than I normally was. Um, when we finally decided to go to the hospital, it was the day after Thanksgiving. Um, we were out of town visiting friends, and I actually fell down some stairs. I... Um, went to go step down and I rolled down the stairs. Uh, my legs completely gave out. They really just didn't know what was wrong, um, especially because someone my age, it's really uncommon to have CIDP. So they did like pretty much every blood test under the sun you could think of. Um, they even told my parents that they weren't sure I was gonna be able to walk ever again. Um, I did have a doctor that thought I was um, <laughs> thought I was faking it all for attention um, when I was first being diagnosed, which was really, um, that was very upsetting for me when I was, when um, I met that doctor. Uh, he had me sit on the floor um, with my legs crossed and pretty much told me to stand up. And so when I, at this point, I, I had lost quite a bit of function too. I could still move my arms, but I had a lot of issues standing on my own at this point, and um, I could, I, I really couldn't walk on my own. I was sitting by the hospital bed, and I went to reach um, for the bed, and he told me, he sternly told me, "No, you cannot do that." Um, so I tried standing up. I, I couldn't really get anywhere. Um, so I started to get upset, and I even started to cry. So. That was really upsetting me. I, I still get a little choked up thinking about that because it was um, the way that he spoke to me just wasn't wasn't very 
<laughs> wasn't very compassionate at all or sympathetic to what I was going through. And um, I think that being compassionate is honestly one of the best things you can do for any of your patients. I think that helps them heal better because they feel like they have a support system. And even if you think someone is, um, or even if you think someone's faking it or um, someone's maybe a hypochondriac and they're over-exaggerating what's wrong with them, I don't think it's really a doctor or nurse's place to tell them that they're faking it until the testing. Now let's move from the specifics of one patient's experiences to a look at what's new in CIDB. In 2021, the European Academy of Neurology slash Peripheral Nerve Society guideline on the diagnosis and treatment of CIDP was published as of second revision, updating the 2010 guidelines. In the previous guidelines, CIDP was subclassified into typical CIDP and atypical CIDP. With the new guidelines, the terminology has been changed to include typical CIDP and CIDP variants. The variants are now well characterized, each presenting with a specific clinical and electrodiagnostic phenotype. Although the previous 2010 guidelines were shown to have quite good diagnostic accuracy, multiple studies have shown that misdiagnosis remains common. This is especially true with regard to CIDP variants. In this guideline, CIDP has been divided, as I mentioned, into typical and variant forms. Those variant forms include distal CIDP, a multifocal or focal CIDP, pure motor CIDP, and pure sensory CIDP. The typical features of the classic form include sensory and motor symptoms, distal sensory loss with proximal and distal weakness, and areflexia occurring for more than two months. Nerve conduction studies show clear evidence of demyelination. The CSF protein is elevated, but the cell count is normal. Routine laboratory studies, and in particular, protein studies should be normal. Although rarely done now, nerve biopsies will show T-cell infiltration and macrophage-associated demyelination. There is a clear response to treatment that is measurable. And as mentioned before, there is no gold standard for the diagnosis. An important component of the diagnosis comes from electrodiagnostic studies where the features support demyelination. These include prolonged distal motor latencies, abnormal temporal dispersion, partial motor conduction block, reduced motor conduction velocities, prolonged F-wave latencies, absence of F-waves, and even distal compound muscle action potential durations. There are features that support the diagnosis, including peripheral nerve or plexus imaging, including both MRI and ultrasound. As we think about the diagnosis of any of the forms of CIDP, either the typical are the variants, the first question that should come to mind is, does the story from the patient sound like it's clinically CIDP? If not, one should think about other diagnoses. The next step in the diagnostic algorithm would be, does the EMG show demyelination or not? If it does, then one can look into the criteria and decide whether there is fulfillment of the diagnostic criteria for either a variant or typical CIDP, that is, clinical and electrodiagnostic features. And if not, we have a lesser category now called possible CIDP. There are ways to raise a possible CIDP diagnosis to a complete CIDP diagnosis using additional tools, the most important of which is a positive response to therapy. There is a differential diagnosis of CIDP that is frequently forgotten. The main one, of course, is chronic idiopathic axonal neuropathies, particularly in the older group. But neuropathies that include vasculitic neuropathies, paraprotonemic neuropathies, diabetic, genetic, amyloid, multifocal motor neuropathy, lymphoma, toxic neuropathies, the recently described autoimmune nodopathies, and even the Canamab syndrome can apparently appear like CIDP and require considerable insight and testing to be certain one is not dealing with one of those and rather dealing with typical CIDP. The first variant I'd like to talk about is distal CIDP. This is one in which the sensory loss is manifest distally in both the upper and lower extremities 
and frequently associated with gait instability. Weakness, when it occurs, is usually in the distal extremities, but can be in the upper extremities. About half to two-thirds of the patients with distal CIDP will, in fact, have an IgM paraproteinemic neuropathy found by serum protein electrophoresis and serum immunofixation. If, however, that patient has anti-MAG antibodies, then it cannot be CIDP as it is a separate disease called anti-MAG neuropathy. There are a number of red flags as listed in the criteria that cast doubt upon the diagnosis of distal CIDP. These are the presence of diabetes, the presence of a positive family history, pain out of proportion to other features, autonomic features, and the presence of monoclonal gammopathies. There is a differential diagnosis, which comes from the RAND flags and includes anti-MAG IgM neuropathies, IgG gammopathies associated with myeloma, diabetic neuropathy, many hereditary neuropathies, including amyloid, bone syndrome, vasculitic neuropathy, autoimmune nodopathies, and again, very importantly, chronic idiopathic axonal neuropathies. The next variant I'd like to discuss is multifocal CIDP. This usually affects the upper limbs first, but in a multifocal pattern, unlike typical CIDP. The lower limbs can be involved later or rarely are involved at the beginning. Cranial nerves are more frequently involved in this variant than in any of the others put together. The red flags here are pain, a positive family history, or systemic signs of vasculitis. Focal CIDP. It's extremely rare usually affects the brachial or lumbosacral plexus, and in fact, can even affect only a single nerve. The red flags, again, are pain, a positive family history, or signs or symptoms of vasculitis. The differential diagnosis for these two forms, the multifocal and the focal, include standard entrapment neuropathies, diabetic radiculopathies and plexopathies, hereditary neuropathy with liability to pressure palsies, multifocal motor neuropathy, brachial plexopathies or neuralgic amyotrophy, isolated peripheral nerve tumors, and vasculitic neuropathies. There is a variant entitled pure motor CIDP, which presents as relatively symmetric proximal and distal weakness without sensory loss. Sensation is normal not only clinically, but also electrodiagnostically, which differs from typical CIDP, where sensation must be abnormal, and multifocal motor neuropathy, where there's asymmetric weakness, mainly affecting the upper limbs. In the motor variant, if sensory conduction is abnormal, we call this motor predominant. It's been noted for a long time that patients with motor CIDP may deteriorate quite significantly after initiation of corticosteroid therapy. There are red flags when one sees so-called motor CIDP. Those include features of either myasthenia or motor neuron disease, such as dyspnea, dysarthria, or dysphagia, a positive family history suggesting a genetic neuropathy, an asymmetric onset suggesting multifocal motor neuropathy, or an elevated CK suggesting myositis. Those diseases I've just mentioned are in the differential diagnosis. The last variant is pure sensory CIDP, which usually presents with gait ataxia with impairment of vibration and position. Patients with this will have changes in cutaneous sensation, but will not have weakness. Long-term studies have suggested that sensory CIDP is a transient clinical stage that precedes the appearance of weakness in at least 70% of the patients. If there's motor conduction abnormalities in a patient with pure sensory CIDP, we call it sensory predominant CIDP. The red flags mention the differential diagnosis, including diabetes, B12 deficiency, chemotherapy-induced polyneuropathy, B6 intoxication, sensory neuronopathies from a large number of causes, IgM monoclonal gammopathies with anti-MAG reactivity, and finally, the very, very rare chronic immune sensory polyneuropathy. As mentioned at the beginning of the talk, overdiagnosis of CIDP is quite common. In a published study from Minnesota, there were four key failings that led to the misdiagnosis. The first was failing to focus on the symptoms and signs that are distinct to CIDP, as I've just mentioned above. The second was making the diagnosis in a patient who didn't seem to be CIDP on the basis of an elevated CSF protein, particularly trivial elevations of CSF protein, as we know are common in the elderly. 
The third mistake was calling an axonal neuropathy a demyelinating neuropathy because there are trivial and well-known expected reductions in motor conduction velocity that accompany axonal polyneuropathies. And lastly, a very common one is failing to assess for and expect a positive clinical response. That is, patients who are treated with immunotherapies should improve, and that improvement should be measurable. If not, it is likely that the diagnosis is incorrect. There are other reasons why the diagnosis of CIDP may be wrong. When a person has prominent neuropathic pain, the diagnosis of CIDP is less likely. If the disease is predominantly distal or solely distal, then this makes the diagnosis less likely as standard late life onset neuropathies are predominantly or solely distal. If there is extensive autonomic involvement, this raises the possibility of amyloid and reduces the possibility of CIDP. Patients with diabetes, particularly without good control, can frequently have very abnormal motor conduction studies and more widespread weakness, but this is not CIDP and does not respond to immunotherapy. If you have a patient in whom the diagnosis was made, either from the CSF protein value or solely from nerve conduction studies, it's unlikely to be CIDP. And last, if in a practice there are lots and lots of CIDP patients from a small geographic area, then epidemiologically, that's not probable, and many of those patients will not have CIDP. The guidelines suggest that the first treatment should be either corticosteroids or IVIG. There are multiple ways to give corticosteroids from using daily oral to pulsed IV to pulsed oral. All of these have been shown in clinical trials to induce improvement. IVIG is usually given as an induction dose of two grams per kilogram over three to five days, and then one or two additional doses before deciding whether IVIG will work or not. Although a first-line treatment is plasma exchange, this is not usually considered unless there's an inadequate response to corticosteroids or IVIG, or unless a patient is declining extremely rapidly. When used, plasma exchange is given two to three times a week for about a month before hoping for an improvement. Once the induction is given and there's improvement, we go to the maintenance phase, which for corticosteroids is usually oral, or for immunoglobulin now converts to either intravenous or subcutaneous immunoglobulin. If there's a complete response, that is the patient returns to normal, one should periodically reduce either the dose or frequency of medication to get to the ultimate outcome of trying to stop treatment. If there's a partial response, one could consider increasing the dose or frequency or adding another treatment. Again, the long-term goal is to try to stop treatment. One of the changes in the 2021 guideline from the 2010 guideline was the addition of subcutaneous immunoglobulin for maintenance therapy. The guideline is agnostic on whether you use IVIG or subcutaneous IG, but rather dosing should be tailored to the individual and in particular, several features of the individual that may not purely be related to the dose. We know that subcutaneous will level out the peaks of IgG that normally occur after intravenous infusion. And for some patients, this results in a smoother course rather than the so-called minor relapses that occur at the end of dosing. Many patients find that there are fewer systemic side effects, such as headache and nausea, with subcutaneous versus intravenous. In my view, the main rationale for subcutaneous is increasing patient autonomy and their quality of life. The PATH trial is a double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled phase three study. The primary endpoint was a CIDP relapse or study withdrawal by 24 weeks. And the conclusion was that both doses, 0.4 and 0.2 grams per kilogram, were effective at maintaining stable disease over 24 weeks. In the extension study, relapses were less frequent at the higher than at the lower dose. Adverse events were seen in many of the patients, but were mild or moderate. In the subcutaneous dosing groups, injection site reaction was common, but declined over time. Let's again hear from our patient, this time with insights on her treatment experience. They gave me steroids on the seventh day and I went home pretty much the next day and I was able to walk at that point. It was um, 
it was very weird being able to not walk one day, I guess, and then 24 hours later having not all of my function, but enough function to be able to um, run up, run up the stairs the next day. So that was, it kind of felt in a way, I guess for a kid, it felt almost magical. Cause you know, um, that's how you as a kid kind of rationalize something like that. I was on steroids for I was on it for about three years and then I started to um, then I went I got with a new doctor who um, started me on IVIG intravenously um, it, they weaned me off of the steroids while I was on IVIG and they kept me on IVIG for the intravenously for 10 years I think about I started seeing a new doctor when I moved here and he was more slightly more specialized in CIDP than my um, previous neurologist was. Um, so he knew a little bit more about it and um, they were worried or he was worried that my veins were going to start collapsing since they hadn't already and he was honest he said that he was surprised that they hadn't all collapsed already and he decided that it would be best to do a subcutaneous um, immunoglobulin treatment. You know, you think it'd be a, a lot more complicated than it is. Um, I had a, I was, I had a nurse come to my house to show me how to do it the first time I did it, and she said that if she, um, if I needed her to come back to show me again, then she could. But honestly, she showed me one time, and I kind of had it down. It was really simple. It's um, and I even wrote like a step by step. Um, in my in like a notebook, in case I forgot a step or something. Um. And every once in a while, you know, you still forget um, to push the medication through the tubing or, you know, something small like that. But um, overall, it really wasn't that hard to learn how to do it. As one considers individualizing treatment decisions, one needs to include discussions about systemic and local adverse effects of the treatment, patient preference, autonomy and independence, importantly, vascular access, and for some, access to specialty treatment facilities. One item that is frequently forgotten is that side effects, particularly of IVIG, increase in frequency as one gets older, and this should be taken into account. As mentioned earlier, the goal of treatment is essentially to stop treatment. That objective is to cure the patient of their disease, that is, to return them to normal off medications. While no one is sure exactly how to do this, there are principles to follow. One should treat aggressively at the start, while knowing that recovery from axonal damage to nerve is slow and not always successful. One should then maintain treatment for a while, 6, 12 months, and then begin to taper treatment with the goal of stopping it. If there are difficulties, there are experts around, particularly those identified by the GBS CIDP Foundation as centers of excellence. Important as one treats in CIDP is to measure outcome. There are a number of ways to do this, but fundamentally, we want to have a clinically meaningful improvement in daily activities. That can be measured with disability scores, such as IROS or NCAT, impairment scales, such as the MRC sum scale, modified NCAT sensory sum score, the neuropathy impairment score, or GRIP meters. There are other measurement tools, including graduated tuning forks and graded monofilaments that can help in the overall assessment of whether a patient is having a clinically meaningful improvement in activities of daily living. What are the summary and takeaway messages? CIDP is frequently misdiagnosed as the clinical data from America suggests that misdiagnosis rates up to 90% can occur. It is hoped that the PNS EAN guidelines will help both diagnosis and treatment. There are experts to help. If IVIG is your first choice of treatment, obtain objective measurements, treat with an induction and two maintenance doses, and remeasure. If there's no significant response, stop IVIG and refer for another opinion. If there's a significant response, find the lowest dose and consider how to cure your patient. On the other hand, if corticosteroids is your first choice, obtain objective measurements, treat for one to three months, and remeasure. If there's no significant response, stop the corticosteroids and refer for another opinion. If there's a significant response, find the lowest dose and consider getting your patient off steroids and cured.
plasma exchange will be almost certainly relegated to those experts at academic medical centers. This concludes our educational activity. I hope you found it informative and useful to your practice. Thank you very much for participating, and thank you very much to our patient for sharing her perspectives. This activity is certified by Medical Learning Institute Incorporated. This activity is developed with our educational partner, PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education.